Hello, everybody. So I am a little bit early. Um, I was starting to get tired, but I wanted to get this information out because there's been a lot of newer articles um, coming out pertaining to Lindsay Clancy's case. So I'm going to pull up um, one of the articles. But first, I actually wanted to... Um, play because I didn't know after the arraignment there was a little bit of a press conference after. Let me just pull up the right video here. So I didn't see this the day of the hearing, so just going to play that real quick while people get the notification. Hopefully they get it. Okay. So this is the press conference after the arraignment that day. I didn't see it. I'm not sure if others did. I think uh, we were most fortunate in getting one of the most compassionate, strong judges in the state of Massachusetts. He did the right thing and uh, has no compunctions whatsoever, entered a very rational, organized uh, order, and I'm very grateful for that because she really needs that treatment. Kevin, when the facts were laid out by the uh, sister victim, can you speak about how that was presented? Because the way it was presented, the DA was minimizing the mental health aspect of the situation. It made it sound over and over again like this was premeditated, but it was the thought um, that playing this by calling in different places, going on Apple Maps. Yeah, I mean, she's a DA. She wants to put the case in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth and whatever inferences she can draw. Um, I think it, it shows a lack of understanding or appreciation of the serious nature of postpartum psychosis, postpartum depression, um, and the SSRIs. I think you know, suggesting that, oh, she was able to communicate with her mom and send her a text and hope you had a nice ride uh, minimizes or shows that she was not um, in, the, in the throes of suicidal ideation or God forbid, homicidal ideation, or depression, or un unable to sleep, insomnia, which was a complaint that was brought many times to the doctor's attention. So I, I, I certainly don't fault the DA for presenting her case like that. Uh, I'm glad the judge was able to understand what the real issues are. But she was able to function and make those phone calls and make that plan, but that doesn't, you're saying that doesn't mean that she wasn't suffering. Well, of course, she, she would not lose, you don't lose the ability to, understand that this is a cell phone and, and I'm going to shake hands with this person and I'm going to get in the car and drive and it's not like you're in a, a total stupor, you know? How would you say that? I'm sorry? As far as her medical condition? It's being evaluated. That's why Dr. Paul Zizel, who is a, a you know, forensic psychologist, he's been with her for the past three days, so that's still being investigated. Can you describe her condition right now? Um, very, very sad affect. Um, she can't move, as you heard in the courtroom. She's confined to the bed. She has to have 24-7 care for obvious reasons. She has no feeling from the navel down. Um, and emotionally, uh, there's a very significant risk of suicide. They have to have a person sit in the room, as you heard, and, and watch her 24-7. So it's not good. You have a hope that a plea agreement could be reached. Would that be the best way to dispose of this case? I certainly do. And uh, I'm hoping that Tim Cruz, who's a you know, former defense attorney and DA for a long time, would be able to understand this is just a tragic case that really should be resolved without the fanfare of a, of a trial in the motion. What would be a fair plea? Uh, that would be a matter of negotiation. In terms of the prosecution, we're talking about a motion to treat it. 
Thomas says he did not have some sort of discussion with her. They simply well, I heard her say I heard her say that she saw one um, doctor and there was an evaluation. I don't know for how long. I don't know for how deep in depth. I don't know what the facts were as far as that. And at that point, uh, the DA said that the doctor said that it did not appear to be postpartum depression, even though she'd made a posting on Facebook uh, about a month or so prior to this, uh, indicating that she felt that she was uh, anxious and depressed because of postpartum. What was the doctor who had the phone with I'm getting the records, and that's, you know, under investigation. What liability do the doctors and the pharmaceutical company there's, 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 there's three dead children right now, and a young woman who was a beautiful woman who's confined to her bed, and a husband who's a walking shell of a human being. I don't really want to talk about money lawsuits at this point. How many medications does she take in your time? Well, 12, but they, you know, they say four at a time. They would stop, get off it. They're on the, uh, how do you pronounce it, sertraline? Um, sertraline. Sertraline. Yeah. And, um, and then the antidepressant, and they put her on the Prozac, and then Taper off the Prozac and put her on the, you know, and the Tripoline. That's what we got. Doctors, I don't want to say something. <coughs> well, I would say, of course. Can you step up the mic? Of course. So, I, I've been meeting with Mrs. Clancy for the past few days, uh, multiple hours each day. What I can say, without going too far, is that her affect is absolutely flattened. She's in a very surreal state. It feels dreamlike to her, as she's described to me on multiple occasions. And individuals who can present as being lucid and linear and clear thinking do not make those people not mentally ill. They have the capacity for, on occasion, to be able to do things that they've been doing for a long period of time. When you have delusional thinking, uh, fixed beliefs that are unchangeable, and hallucinations, namely command hallucinations, telling you to do things, telling you to do things that are malevolent, and you believe those voices that are telling you you need to follow what they say, that's when things go downhill behaviorally, psychiatrically, and, and familially. And that's what, that's what we see in the most tragic of cases where individuals who could be healthy and normal, and quite frankly, because they're paranoid and worried about what others think, they hold back from what they share. And in some cases throughout the country and the world, these are people who one day will be functioning well, but because they have the onset of command hallucinations, which they adhere to and they believe the voice that they have to do something, that's when tragedy occurs. And I think that sort of is under the, the override rubric that this case falls under. Watch breaking news on YouTube. Hi, like, yeah, it was them. They weren't speaking into the microphone. But I just wanted to show that there was a press release, and the lawyer didn't seem like he wanted to speak to the cameras or in the microphones or anything. That's what it seemed like. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show that there was a press release after the um the hair that day i didn't see it that day um i'm not sure if anybody else did so i just wanted to kind of share that yeah yeah the lawyer um <clears throat> the lawyer was kind of looking down and that was the psychiatrist like um from what i was hearing and I tried to put the closed captions on but they weren't cooperating with me unfortunately <laughs> but there is um there was a, another lawyer um a very a lawyer that um did deal with like cases like this before and he had talked to a few of the news media, so that's why I kind of wanted to um, talk about this again, because they had said that the lawyers and the prosecutors are going to kind of have to, like, get into Lindsay's mind in order in order to figure out what really happened that day. 
Um, so I'm going to kind of go through this. So the title is In Our Mind, Crucial Lindsay Clancy Evidence Could Sail, <coughs> excuse me, Fate of Mom Who's Driving Three Kids to Death with Exercise Band, Lawyer Warns. A mom suffering from mental illness could be found guilty of premeditated murder and the brutal deaths of her three children if prosecutors point to crucial evidence, a lawyer has said. Lindsay Clancy, 32, faces several criminal charges after allegedly strangling her children with exercise bands while her husband was out picking up dinner. <clears throat> Lindsay Clancy could be found guilty of premeditated murder in the brutal deaths of her three children, a lawyer says. Colonel Defense Attorney Duncan Levin that prosecute, claimed that prosecutors could point to key places, pieces of evidence that show she was lucid when the alleged murders occurred. Levin also pointed out that there is evidence on both sides as the defense claims Clancy was a zombie after being over-medicated before the alleged killings. Defense attorney Duncan Levin, who has represented, rep, uh, represented, excuse me, let me scroll down to that picture. And then I'll scroll down a little bit more. That's another picture. And then her at the beach with the kids. The likes of Anna Delvey and Harvey Weinstein. I claim that both the defense prosecutors, yeah, it is very heartbreaking. And, you know, they kind of, they really have a point. They are going to have to figure out, you know, was she really, what was she really thinking that day? Where was her brain at? And things like that. It is very, very, very heartbreaking. All right, so let me get back to here. Okay. So claim that both the, the defense and prosecutors will have to get inside the mind of Clancy should the case go to trial. This case is not going to center around whether she committed the murders or not, Levin told the U.S. Sun in an exclusive interview. That's something that is not going to be an issue in this case. What is going to be an issue is her mental state and whether she was legally responsible. On January 24th, Clancy's husband, Patrick, was horrified to discover their children, Cora, by Dawson III, and seven-month-old Colin, fatally wounded inside their Duxbury home. Officials raced to the scene and took the mother to a hospital. where she remains in recovery after allegedly launching herself out of a window in a failed suicide attempt. Attorneys claim prosecutors hit her with two counts of first degree murder, three counts of strangulation and suffocation and three counts of assault with a deadly weapon following the horrific event that shattered high level, that shattered the small community. She stands accused of killing her infant, but does not currently face charges related to his death. 
Her team pleaded not guilty on her behalf at her arraignment last week, citing mental health issues that allegedly wrecked the mother's postnatal mind. Clancy's heart-wrenching case has sparked nationwide. Conversations on postpartum psychosis, as her defense attorney, Kevin Runnington, described her as a zombie. Following over medication in the weeks leading up to the killings, the issue has gone to the state level after a new bill was introduced by Massachusetts Representative Jim O'Day, which would find a woman who gave birth within a year committing a crime not guilty if they're diagnosed with postpartum health issues. So I'm curious, and high level if you didn't hear me, um, I'm curious if, so the mother's attorney mentioned that she had a brief stint in a mental hospital avid a battle with depression three weeks before the fatal day, but was sent home after five days with two new prescriptions. I'm really curious if that is pertaining to murder as well. Rennington noted that Clancy was taking 12 medications at the time of the killings. In the video that I did before, I did go over the interactions of the medications of um, these medications included Prozac, Seroquel, which allegedly gave her side effects such as homicidal and suicidal ideation. And there was, she was on like two or three different benzos and like all kinds of stuff. Um, prosecutor said during her arraignment on February 8th that she told her husband she heard a male voice telling her to kill the children because it was her last chance. So she was diagnosed, yeah, she was diagnosed with postpartum. That's what they're saying. Um, but they're also saying another doctor diagnosed, didn't diagnose her with that. I believe that doctor was the one at the hospital that she's at now. <clears throat> Despite facing serious mental health struggles, prosecuting attorneys are arguing that Clancy was lucid and committed premeditated murder based on key evidence pointed out by Levin. Premeditated plan according to Massachusetts state law the burden of proof lies within the state. This means that prosecutors will have to point to evidence that could prove Clancy was of sound mind when she allegedly killed her children. Hold on, let me just make sure. This means prosecutor put Bruce son of mine when she killed her children. Rather than the defense being pressured to prove she was suffering from psychosis. Clancy, Clancy began January 24th by taking her out of Cora to a doctor's appointment. And the medical office staff reported that she was acting normally. State attorney said she then returned home where she played in the snow with Cora and Dawson. The three built a snowman and sent photos of it to the family. Prosecutors say. The mother also looked up a restaurant 11 minutes away to order takeout and asked her husband, Patrick, who was working from home, to leave and pick up the food. This errand could have been made in an effort to lure him away from for a longer period of time so that she had more time to commit these murders. 11 claims. Throughout the day, <clears throat> Clancy also had phone conversations with doctors and her husband, which both parties have recalled to be relatively normal. According to Levin, 
prosecutors could claim that she was thinking clearly, speaking clear, and was calm, cool, and collected mind. While arguing against the mom, the prosecution is going to have to prove that even if she was mentally ill, she still knew that what she was doing was wrong or illegal, Levin claimed. <clears throat> they will use the evidence to show that she was not suffering from psychosis at the time of the murders. Balanced and calm was a statement from the prosecutor. Clancy's husband has joined dozens in their small community to rally for the accused mother and voice their support. She is a great human being, and you'd be hard for us to hear anything but positive remarks about her. But our sweet, our dear sweet, sweet Lindsay, said Laura Sanders, a nurse who worked alongside Clancy for years at Massachusetts General Hospital, according to local news station Boston 25. Around 100 mothers in the surrounding areas have signed a letter to show their support and empathy for Lindsay. Patrick Clancy has publicly begged for forgiveness on his wife's behalf. A GoFundMe, which was set up to raise funds for the family, amassed over $1 million, leading the husband to release an emotional statement where he said, the very fibers of my, of the very fibers of Clancy's soul, soul are loving. Her passion taught me to be a better father, he wrote. Lindsay first appeared in court via Zoom while she lay in a hospital bed with a mask on her face. She spoke only to acknowledge the judge when he directly asked her questions. The accused mother is still recovering from serious injuries as her attorney has claimed <clears throat> that she could be paralyzed from the waist down. The case is pending after the Zoom hearing and a probable cause is set for May 2nd. Should the case move to trial, it could take over a year until an unbiased jury is selected, Levin said, based on his experience. This is a small community and likely the jurors at a trial, if it goes to trial, are likely to know at least some of the people involved in this case, Levin said. And it's true, Duxbury is small and is next to a few small towns. Um, <clears throat> and the court will need to find a way to protect her legal rights to get a fair trial. I'm going to show you guys this picture in the article. I expect that this will be likely process because there's still an active investigation going on. I was thinking there's going to be more pictures, but I guess not. So that is that article, which is states that they are going to have to figure out um, the factor of her mental health that day. Um, because all those hints are hinting towards the fact that she was okay that day. Um, and I know that's not a mental health evaluation, but she was lucid. She was talking. She was talking to doctors. She gave directions um, and things like that. Usually when you're a zombie and things like that and you can't give directions, you're not, I mean, and you're in that state of mind, you can't really give directions per se. Um, so that's what they're kind of getting at. And so the court is going to have to really, really prove that she was lucid that day. 
And there's a lot in this case because of the fact that she was on 13 different medications. And the side effects of those medications do prove that she could have been in a horrible mental state because of the side effects of them mixing together. And even um, if you look up like Prozac and Seroquel mixed together, they're not supposed to be mis mixed together. And there's another one. There's like, there was a whole list. Um, let me see if I can find that list real quick. But there was a whole list of all the medications. Um, <clears throat> so the medications were medications, medications were. I just saw the list. I mean, they were really like, you know, there was clonopin, trazodone, Prozac, Remron, which is really, really strong medication that they usually don't use nowadays. But if you're having really bad insomnia, okay, here it is. So the medications, Soloft was one, Ambien, that's all that article is saying. Um, I'm going to go back over here because they had a little bit of a list over here. Let me go back to this list. All right, so Prozac, Ativan, Hydroxyzine, Seroquel, Ampitripoline, Trazodone, Remron. That's not all of them, that's, but that's just kind of like an idea of all those medications that are mixed. Yeah, and there are a lot of them more SSRIs. So if you put so many SSRIs together, you're not going to get a good mixture at all. I just want to see because... Oh no, okay. <clears throat> but there was uh, quite a few of the SSRIs and that kind of scared me because I'm like, wow, like what doctor like really um, would do this? Like, And I'm surprised she took them and she didn't ask any questions. You know what I mean? Like I would be con I would be concerned. Like if I was married to someone and they wanted them to take all these medications. That's just a lot. Too much, way, way too much medications. But I do know there is, um, like her friends are supporting her, you know, and not for nothing, like, I'm really not surprised her friends are supporting her because once you are in nursing and things like that, it kind of becomes a family type things. You know what I mean? Like, let me just get rid of that. So, and the kids were so, so young. 
Um, Lindsay Clancy was the epitome of a mother, says her attorney, who argues that being over-medicated with powerful medication caused her to have a psychotic break. Look at the, the baby, you know what I mean? The baby was so, so young. Kills me, kills me. So Lindsay Clancy was the kind of mom who paid attention to every little detail when it came to her children. For Christmas, she dressed her daughter Cora and her middle son Dawson in matching red plaid skirt shirts. Adorning Cora's hair with a festive bow and ascending Dawson's look with a little gray bow tie. On the first day of school last September, Lindsay 32 made sure Cora 5 and Dawson 3 had new backpacks and everything they needed for kindergarten and preschool. She proudly posted an online picture from the first day of school showing the beaming siblings with their dad, Patrick 34, and seven month old little brother, Callan on the front steps of their Duxbury home, just 30 minutes south of Boston. A longtime labor and delivery nurse, Lindsay kept in shape by pushing Dawson in his stroller with Cora pedaling next to her on her red tricycle that perfectly matched the color of her tiny bike helmet. She was always working out and going everywhere with the kids, says Michelle Connor, 32 who was on the cheerleading team with Lindsay at Quinnipiac College in Ham Hamden, Connecticut, and kept up with her, her on Facebook. She was that mom that you always wanted to be, Connor says. Now, the woman who took so much pride in being a good mom has been accused of killing her three kids during what her lawyer says was a psychotic break. After allegedly killing her children, Lindsay allegedly slit her wrists and neck and then leaped from the second story bedroom window in an attempt at suicide. Unaliving herself, excuse me. Prosecutor said. Hospitalized and paralyzed from the waist down, from her fall, Lindsay faces a slew of charges, including two counts of murder and three counts of strangulation in connection with the deaths of her three children. She has not yet been charged with the murder of Colin's death. She pleaded not guilty to all the charges from her hospital bed during her virtual February 7th arraignment. Psychosis or premeditated murder? That is the huge, huge question here. On January 24th, Patrick came home to find Lindsay lying in the backyard after her alleged unaliving attempt. While he was on the phone with 911 dispatcher, he asked her where the kids were. She replied, in the basement. To his horror, he found all three children lying face down on the floor while exercise bands tied around their necks, according to the probable cause affidavit. He frantically removed the bands from around their necks and begged them to breathe. Assistant District Attorney Jennifer Sprague said during Lindsay's arraignment. Plymouth County prosecutors say the killings were premeditated and that Lindsay waited until Patrick was out of the house running errands, as we know. Um, she had asked him to complete to allegedly murder the children. <clears throat> she planned these murders, gave herself the time and privacy needed to commit the murders, and then she strangled each child in place where they should have felt the safest at home with their mom, Sprague said, during the arraignment. She did so with deliberate premeditation, extreme atrocity, and cruelty. But Lindsay defense attorney Kevin Reddington says this tragic situation is a product of mental illness. Lindsay, he said in court, was being treated for anxiety and postpartum illness following Cullen's birth last May with up to 13 psychiatric medications that may have caused her to have suicidal and homicidal thoughts and suffer a psychotic break. 
Lindsay was prescribed some pretty heavy medications. He told People, People, which is People magazine, it was a toxic soup. While Lindsay has been the subject of harsh criticism on social medias, social media, others, including Connor, know that women often struggle after giving birth. You, you have this new baby, <clears throat> she says, and you're supposed to be happy. You have a baby and it's not always like that. What concerns her, she says, is that Lindsay repeatedly asked for help. You have someone who's educated in science and a nurse and knows what to look for. And she's asking for help and getting help. But what didn't happen, she says. What help did she not get that she she should have had? It's scary. The lawyer says, the lawyer says Lindsay was overmedicated. So after she gave birth to Colin, Lindsay sought help from doctors because she was feeling anxious and depressed. She saw a doctor, doctor, excuse me, who prescribed an antidepressant and other drugs, says Remington, that caused her an adverse reaction. She wrote in a social media post last fall, she kept complaining about how she was failing, says Reddington. Between October and January, he says, she was prescribed more drugs, including sedatives, sleep aids, mood stabilizers, and anti-anxiety pills, and various combinations. Calling Lindsay over-medicated, Reddington said, that during the time that she was prescribed these medications, they both would go back to the doctor and then they would tell her to get off the medicine and start up on something else, he says. They didn't even get her to wean off it before starting her on something else, he says. If that didn't work, they'd change it. So if they told her to get off the medicine if they told her to get off the medicine, why was she still taking the medicine? It went like that into January. On January 1st, Lindsay checked herself into McLean Hospital a Psychiatric Facility in Belmont and was released five days later. After being taken off some drugs and put on others, he said, when she got out, she still felt unwell and kept going back to doctors to let them know. Reddington says, Lindsay's next court date is May 2nd. If you know, if you or someone you know is considering unaliving themselves, please contact 988 Suicide Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. Text strength to the crisis text line at 741 741. Yeah, she was trying to seek help, but um, it does also seem like she was, like, the statement that he said, the weaning off and stuff like that, but she was still taking medication that they told her to get off of. That's what puzzles me. There. So I'm probably going to look into that more. A little bit more, at least. Because that part is what confused me a little bit. And, you know, there was some stuff that, you know, does seem premeditated. Um, you know, having the dad go out and get the stuff. Um, and some other things. Like the whole situation just seemed kind of off. I mean, anybody killing their kids seems kind of off. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it's not going to seem proper to anybody or correct to anybody because you're not supposed to hurt your children. Um, so, human, being a human, you're not going to think any of this sounds correct. So it just, 
but Boston Psychiatrics too early to draw conclusions. So the day after the arraignment, the, there was a psychiatrist that did state that it's too soon <clears throat> for people to speculate about the situation due to the fact that there wasn't too much information out um, besides the fact that she could or couldn't have um, postpartum depression. They're obviously going to do um, their own evaluations because they always do. Um, mostly in this case, they're going to have an evaluation. They probably already did a talk screen um, and things like that to see what's in her system to prove, you know, the defense attorney wrong. Um, or to prove, you know, what was in her system that day so they can get down to the bottom of, okay, was it the medication or was it really mom doing this to her kids? You know, things like that. Oh, so there is an outrage. I'm not sure if anybody has seen this. So there's an outrage because people are raising money for her. Old roofs needed. We're looking for old roofs to replace with our new permanent metal roofs. Can we replace yours? Click the link on or below this video now and enter your zip code to check. Self-care starts at sunrise, smoothie lovers. Get that morning me time in. Sorry about that. I didn't know it was the 911 call. Um, I thought it was the, actually, the thing on... An evening to benefit Lindsay Clancy. The spirit of compassion, please attend this dinner event. This is mental health, women's health prescription, drug tragedy. Everyone has a constitutional right to defend themselves and present the truth. Thanks to our food sponsors, 100% of the ticket sales go directly to our parents to pay for litigation defense and cost of expert witnesses where and it says where forty dollars per person lindsay currently faces the two first degree murder charges strangulation the fundraising event has recently scheduled for head dad's restaurant on february 20th according to a flyer Included in a slew of Reddit posts, the thread has since been deleted, but it included a fire that detailed a dinner event for mental health, women's health prescription drug tragedy on behalf of Lindsay. In the spirit of compassion, please attend this dinner event. This is a mental health, women's health prescription drug tragedy. 
The post formerly read. Wow. So I wonder if they're really, on February 10th, the restaurant canceled the alleged fundraiser. The local established took to Facebook on the evening of February 10th to post that they had not known about the event, event's purpose until recently that the outside group had booked it. An effort to address the comments coming in nationwide from a thread on Reddit. Wow. So they didn't even know that it was a fundraiser um, <clears throat> going in their restaurant. So that's kind of messed up. Oh, what did I do here? So they ended up canceling the event. So the event's not going to happen. People were going all over their Facebook page about this event. Oh, they didn't get an official comment about the uh, from the group that made the event or the restaurant. Oh. I mean, I could understand if it was like for the kids' funerals or whatnot, but it was for the um, the attorney. And stuff, and everybody does have the right to be an attorney, but she can get a pro bono attorney if she needs an attorney. Um, they do allow everybody basically to get it's called being indigent, and they give them an attorney. So that's really that's kind of really shady to do that in your own community, honestly. I'm, actually, I'm really not surprised at this point, <laughs> you know, in this kind of stuff. But all right, so that is um, pretty much all the stuff that has come up so far. So they are kind of seeing what the fate is, you know, kind of seeing, you know, what her mental state was, and they have to see what her mental state was that day. I'm sure there's going to be, when they do the May 2nd hearing, I'm sure they're going to order um, a mental health evaluation. And the mental health evaluation will be by the um, state. They always do it by the state. They don't go by um, like what the um, defendant wants or whatnot. Because we've been seeing that in Corey's Bigsby case. So. <clears throat> No problem. I'll keep you guys updated because I know a lot of people, you know, I got a replay crew mostly on these types of cases. I know a lot of people don't like, you know, watching it. Um, and they kind of watch it at their own pace and things like that. Thank you for coming in and watching it, um, watching the news and stuff with me. And I will see you again soon. I'll see you t tomorrow morning, I think. Yes, tomorrow morning. I'm always on in the morning. So I will see you guys tomorrow. And you guys have a great night. Get some rest. Sweet dreams.